Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see you. And this morning's chalice lighting is from Jennifer Gregson, and it's called Connected Through the Web of Life. And as I light the chalice, which I am putting before me now, please join me in reading these words. We light this chalice, symbol of our purpose to bring more love and justice into the world. We light this chalice, knowing our congregation as both dispersed and also deeply connected through the web of life. And now Bill will offer a land acknowledgement today. Thank you, Joanne. Um, before our service begins, we honor today the peoples indigenous to Half Moon Bay the Chiguan tribe of the Ramaytu Shaloni, who lived on this land before occupation by Europeans. Um, please join me in reading this land acknowledgement. UUCC acknowledges that Half Moon Bay and the San Mateo County Coast site are located on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytu Shaloni. Further, UUCC recognizes that, as the original stewards of this land, the Ramaytu Shaloni understood profoundly the interconnectedness of all things and maintained harmony with nature for millennia. Today, UUCC honors the Ramaytu Shaloni peoples for their enduring commitment to Mother Earth, to peace, and to the weaving of peace. Land acknowledgements are just one small step toward reconciling with the native peoples whose lives were disrupted by colonial conquests. Today's service draws on the deep wisdom of the First Nations, and we recognize that there remains much wisdom not yet tapped. Our UU Coastside services follow monthly themes from Touchstones and this month's theme is justice. And today, Bill Hevelin will present a service entitled, Darn Socks, A Knitter Contemplates Justice. Bill contemplates justice through the fingers of a knitter darning a sock. Inspired by the writings of historian Nicole Eustace in Native American history, he widens our perspective about what outcomes might constitute justice and which frameworks might inspire hope. Thank you, Noreen. So I want to read this poem by Naomi Shahab Nye. Um, I read it before, but I, I, it's connected to the service today. Um, she was born uh, in America to a Palestinian father and American mother, and she went to high school in the West Bank and this poem, Jerusalem, is dated October 13, 2023, and it appears in her anthology um, entitled Red Suitcase. And to a region saturated by so much history and besotted by honor, retribution, and revenge, this poem foreshadows almost everything I have to say today. I'm not interested in who suffered the most. I'm interested in people getting over it. Once when my father was a boy, a stone hit him on the head. Hair would never grow there. Our fingers found the tender spot and its riddle. The boy who has fallen stands up. A bucket of pears in his mother's doorway welcomes him home. The pears are not crying. Later, his friend who threw the stone says he was aiming at a bird. And my father starts growing wings. Each carries a tender spot. Something our lives forgot to give us. A man builds a house and says, I am a native now. A woman speaks to a tree in place of her son. 
and olives come. A child's poem says, I don't like wars. They end up with monuments. He's painting a bird with wings wide enough to cover two roofs at once. Why are we so monumentally slow? Soldiers stalk a pharmacy, big guns, little pills. If you tilt your head just slightly, it's ridiculous. There's a place in my brain where hate won't grow. I touch its riddle, wind and seeds. Something pokes us as we sleep. It's late, but everything comes next. So now my sermon. So let's start with some acknowledgements. I'm really indebted to Bruce Raffnell here for first telling me about the Great Treaty of 1722. And for free, further detail, I benefited from the research and writings of historian Nicole Eustace. And for the Iliad, I rely on the commentaries from Homer scholar Emily Wilson. If you were to look at our Christmas tree, you would likely notice our ornaments are eggs. Here's one. That's uh, Achilles. That's foreshadowing. That's fine literary tradition of foreshadowing. Anyway, I make Easter eggs in the Ukrainian style, some combination of patterns and colors. And after Thanksgiving, I add a string or to two or three of these Easter eggs and hang them on our Christmas tree. Over the years, our collection builds up. So you might understand why I'm drawn to this egg. This one's of onyx near my wife's sewing box. It's a darning egg designed to provide a round service while repairing a heel of a sock. Most darning eggs are wooden eggs like this, but that one's onyx. So darning's like this. The egg goes into the heel of the sock where the hole is, stretches it so the, sock, the hole's held smoothly open. And then with yarn about the same gauge as that of the sock, you add stitches to span the hole in the sock up and down, that's the warp of the repair. And then perpendicular to the warp, you weave thread alternately above and below this warp. That's the weft of the weave. And a circle of stitches anchors the patch, a touch of ironing smooths it flat, and voila, you have a darn sock. So a few notes about darn socks. First, Darning's not knitting, in some nerdy needle craft sense. Darning's more like weaving. The darned hole doesn't become invisible. It leaves a scar. You can make darning patches less visible by matching the sock's color, or you can transform it to something decorative using contrasting colors. But it's not a seamless, invisible repair. It's not even knitting. Darning makes the sock both serviceable and adds a layer to the sock, to the history of the sock. Second, darning is meditative. When you darn, you and your fingers are quite preoccupied by the darning and all its fine motor tasks. And yet part of your mind frees up to contemplate stuff. All needle crafts share this meditative aspect. Fingers busy while your brain on background comes forward. In darning a sock, you do stuff like picking points to draw a warp thread, 
choosing the color of the weft thread, securing the darning edge, settling for the non-match of the knit. These are all things you and your fingers consider while another part of your mind thinks and wanders more widely. Oh, and there's something a darner never does, never even considers doing, would find ridiculous if it were ever even suggested. A darner never picks up a hammer to polarize the rock that tore the hole in the sock that now you find yourself darning. And yet, this is exactly how our criminal justice system operates. You've probably come here today knowing that I was talking about justice. And in talking about, dwelling about the darning of socks, you're maybe expecting I'll say something about repairing our social fabric. And that's right. That's where I'm headed. And that reference to smashing the rock that tore the sock, that's the logic of Abrahamic justice. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I'm discussing that too. And I'm going to dwell on this eye tooth justice for a little while. Speak as if to make things harder or worse before I offer anything helpful. Because I feel we need to journey together to unlearn something before we learn something. Eye for an eye justice, Abrahamic justice is deeply deeply embedded in our Western culture and many others. Anthropologists call this kind of culture that seeks retribution for slights and injuries an honor culture. The Iliad, Homer's epic poem set during the Trojan War, is one tale about honor and revenge and their tragic consequences. And I contemplate this work partly to avoid suggesting all our problems stem from the Bible and partly to show the deep roots of honor culture in Western civilization. Homer's poem, the Iliad is not about the Trojan War, but it is set within the Trojan War. Neither the beginning of this war nor its conclusion are part of this epic poem. The Iliad begins 10 years in, and the Greeks' foremost hero, Achilles, is pouting on the sidelines, his honor offended. It's about a girl, a sex slave, slave actually, Briseis, taken from him by the Greek commander, Agamemnon. So Achilles on strike, and that's book one of the Iliad's 24 books. So the Trojans start winning. By book 12, they're at the Greek fortifications. By book 15, they're about to burn their ships. Book 16, Achilles double best friend Patroclus dresses up in Achilles armor and routs the Trojans. And then overreaching, he's killed by Hector, who's son of Troy's King Priam. In rage, by book 21, Achilles has killed a lot of Trojans now. In book 22, he kills Hector drags his body around the city. And in that last book, book 24, Priam appears in Achilles' tent. They grieve together. Achilles for Patroclus, Priam for Hector. And the poem concludes with Hector's funeral. 
This is the backbone plot of the Iliad. The backbone plot, not some nerdy commentary on some obscure subplot. The Briseis slight um, to Achilles' honor leads to the greater loss of Patroclus's life. And Achilles' revenge, killing Hector, does not quench his grief because revenge never quenches grief. Revenge never quenches grief. And Homer provides no answer for what does. And sometimes a culture's unanswered questions become simply forgotten. And we as a Western culture with our tradition of eye tooth justice, where revenge dresses up in the robe of justice, we've forgotten ever knowing this, that revenge doesn't fill that emptiness that grief carves out of us. So we do revenge anyway, get even anyway. It's in the Bible and in our laws. And yet, as Homer scholar and translator Emily Wilson comments, even enemies like Priam and Achilles can share a moment of grief. Anger drives communities apart. Grief brings them together over a shared acknowledgement of irredeemable loss. So grief can bring communities together. And in this, there's a subvocal whisper of an answer to that question we've forgotten how to ask. And this country, the United States of America, from its founding era comes an extraordinary forgotten story of grief and reconciliation. We, the Anglo-Americans, Anglo did not write this story. We forgot this story, this extraordinary forgotten story. It's 1722, province of Pennsylvania, Quaker founder, William Penn, he's been dead for four years. And this star story starts out badly. Because in Conestoga, Pennsylvania, two white traders, John and Edmund Cartledge, brawl drunkenly with Sawantani, a chief of the Seneca Nation. It's a trade deal gone bad. The Seneca are one of the five nations of the Haudenosaunee, sometimes called the Iroquois. Sawantani dies of his injuries from this alcohol-laden brawl. And across Iroquois, it's a diplomatic crisis. So, if this were a movie Western, or a Homeric poem, or in the Bible, just imagine the next scene. Native warriors silhouetted on the ridgeline, then the charge. It's war for revenge, for honor, for justice. And that's what the colonial leaders imagined. So they went all proactive, like good Englishmen. They arrested John and Edmund Cartledge slammed their tuckuses into Philadelphia's cramped attic jail for murder. That's a capital crime, intent on trying them in court and hanging them until dead. Hoping in doing so, both to prevent a war, to resolve the diplomatic crisis, and to demonstrate the superiority of the Anglo-American legal system. A nice tidy package to present to the offended native nations. And then the really interesting stuff happened. 
a Cayuga hunter of some status, Sachi Choe, rode into Philadelphia to say what the Haudenosaunee really thought. Yes, this murder is a big deal. So gather the governors of the provinces of New York and Pennsylvania and the colony of Virginia in Albany and meet with the leaders of the five nations of the Haudenosaunee's. And they desired John Cartledge may not die for this. They want reparations, not retributions. The Pennsylvania governor protests that by the laws of the great king, such a man by our laws must die. Sachichoe, a skilled diplomat actually, traveling regularly among the five nations says, one life is enough to be lost. There should not two die. Albany happens. Reconciliation happens. A combination of wealth transfer, expressed empathy, and spiritual engagement by John Cartledge, and witnessed by representatives of the three English colonies. By extension, reconciliation echoed from these representations. Many speeches from the Haudenosaunee. Anglo-American scribes faithfully recorded them, probably never comprehended them, and certainly forgot them. A Haudenosaunee representative declared, we do, in the name of all the five nations, forgive the offense and desire you will likewise forgive it. So the cartilages were released and for good measure, as a courtesy, the Haudenosaunee confirmed the Pennsylvania land claims. So that's why the great treaty of 1722 has been continuously honored to this day. This last moment flick of a real estate deal. So what happened here? Well, from the Anglo-American point of view, they made a big business deal. No war, confirmed land claims, two of their own not hanged in exchange for not dishing out eye tooth justice just one time. No hanging, no war. From the point of view of the Five Nations, Sawantani's widow, Winipi Weta, received compensation in trade goods, a ritualized closure to her loss, a darned sock with scar. Winipi Weta's heart now carried a scar. She was not made whole, but held now some implied social capital. John Cartledge, both a high status trader and a justice of the peace, now owed her something intangible. John Cartledge was restored, restored as a friend of the Haudenosaunee, as a trader with them. Grief can draw communities together. So two asides here. First aside, perhaps we have witnessed exactly this in Half Moon Bay. The consequence of the January 23rd, 2023 mass shooting, for some people, grief has transformed into empathy and the desire to help local farm workers, like maybe get some decent housing. These efforts aren't straightforward. And there's grumpy opposition from landlord interests. But we endeavor on, Joanne here an order of magnitude more than I. We endeavor on. Second aside, this tale of the 1722 treaty reveals another cultural difference. 
what do trading goods really mean? The Anglo-Americans, like contemporary landlords, map trade to money. They exchange goods for profit. Objects monetized. In contrast, the Haudenosaunee view trade more like gift exchanges, nourishing relationships, more like Christmas giving than department store shopping, expressing human interrelationships, more like roommates, less like landlords. Now that's a thought to darn stitches with. Returning to justice. If you think about it, eye tooth justice looks backwards into the past. Revenge reacts to the past insult or injury. In contrast, the restorative justice of the Haudenosaunee looks forward, asks what future we would like to achieve, like, okay, that was bad. How do we fix this? A crime tears a hole in the social fabric and restorative justice patches the social fabric, darns it up, not perfect. Darning leaves a scar, but it's serviceable, adds a layer, a story. The poem I read today by Naomi, Naomi Shahab Nye, Jerusalem. To me, the first lines are key. I'm not interested in who suffered the most. I'm interested in people getting over it. She looks forward, calls forth to imagine the world we want to live in tomorrow. This is the essence of restorative justice, this viewpoint that looks forward. Her next lines. Once my father was a boy, a stone hit him in the head. Hair would never grow there. So Nye's father had a scar. You darn a sock, you leave a scar. Every scar can tell a story. So does every darn sock. Every darn sock tells a story ending in hope. Life, wound, scar, more life. Nye's poem ends with these six words. It's late, but everything comes next. Acknowledging both the troubled Palestinian history and pointing us toward the future. Like you wake up after an awful storm, you wake up into a clear blue morning, into a clear blue morning wearing some cozy darn sock and a smile beside your life's other scars. And you just know that the rest of the day is going to be beautiful because it may be late, but everything comes next. So darn it, go and weave some peace. Speaking of weaving, Let's pause to enjoy this thickly interwoven version of Dolly Parton's Clear Blue Morning, performed by Anan Brian Darcy. Anan is part of the Baba Hari Das community at Mount Madonna Center in Watsonville. He's teaching an upcoming workshop on restorative yoga and live music on February 19th. So please enjoy. It's been a long, dark night And I've been looking for the morning It's been a long, hard fight But I see a brand new day dawning I've been looking for sunshine Cause I ain't seen it in so long And everything's gonna work out just fine Everything's gonna be all right 
that's been all wrong Cause I can see the light clear in the morning I can see been a long, long time since I've known the taste of freedom and those clinging minds that had me bound well I don't need a I can see the light of a brand new day. I can see the light of a clear blue morning. Everything's gonna be alright. It's gonna be Thank you so much, Bill, for this talk with such a fresh view about justice. And thank you, Bruce, for sharing your deep thoughts on restorative justice and providing a creative spark. It's inspiring to think about justice as the we reweaving of frayed and torn social connections. Here at UUCC, we work hard at connecting to one another and to connect with other UU congregations. We're so happy that our friends um, from UUCC are joining us today, even if it's for unfortunate reasons. And we greet you warmly, our dear sister congregation. We will never forget how we helped one another out during the pandemic. Now this community, this Unitarian Universalist Coastside community, 
consists really of just people and its interconnections, its ties, the threads and social yarn that knit us one to another. And when you give to this community, it furthers the bonds knitting this community together. So while donations take place, let's enjoy this interlude by Navajo classical pianist and composer Connor Chi entitled Weaving. It's a beautiful video.